want us to just take a look at Isaiah 33. In the beginning of this prophecy, Isaiah continues the theme he had in the last couple of chapters of foretelling the Assyrian siege against Jerusalem under Sennacherib. The latter part of this chapter, Isaiah tells us of the coming of the Messiah. And that's where we're going to spend the bulk of our time this evening. Isaiah chapter 33, we'll read verse 1 and then we'll pray. Woe to thee that spoilest, and thou, that, and, and thou wast not spoiled, and dealest treacherously, and they dealt not treacherously with thee. When thou shalt cease to spoil, thou shalt be spoiled. And when thou shalt make an end to deal treacherously, they shall deal treacherously with thee. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. I ask that you'll speak to us through this evening. Give us an understanding, we pray. Touch our hearts individually. Cause us to be mindful of your strength and yet your mercy and your grace. Lord, help us to truly turn our eyes upon you. Now, Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In verse 1, again, talking about Sennacherib, his siege to Jerusalem, and it says, Woe to thee that spoilest, and thou wast not spoiled. And dealest treacherously, and they dealt not treacherously with thee. When thou shalt cease to spoil, thou shalt be spoiled. When thou shalt make an end to deal treacherously, they shall deal treacherously with thee. And here's what happened in, in what it's talking about. Uh, Sennacherib was on a campaign, as many other men have been throughout history, to go out and conquer, and to conquer his part of the world, and to build an empire. And the Assyrian Empire he had in mind. And so he worked to do this, and he had conquered many cities and countries already, and he came against Jerusalem. Now, at this point, the northern kingdom is not a factor, so it's just dealing with Judah and Jerusalem. And he did some damage to the region of Judah. But God intervened, and God speaks judgment on Sennacherib here. And God defeated, without the people of Judah having to fight at all, God defeated the Assyrian army and drove Sennacherib back home, where actually, shortly after getting back home, he was assassinated. So let's come down to verse 2, where Isaiah begins to talk to the Lord. Because the Lord rescues his people. In verse 2 it says, O Lord, be gracious unto us. We have waited for thee. Be thou their arm every morning, our salvation also in time of trouble. At the noise of tumult, the people fled. Now, again, we're going to talk a good bit about prophecy and understanding how a biblical prophecy is written this evening. Whenever you come across that phrase, the people, that means the people of Israel, or in this case, the people of Judah and Jerusalem. So at the new noise of tumult, the people fled. This is a, a prayer of crying out to God. And the people were threatened by the Assyrian army, and they were afraid. And the people of Judah, not the city of Jerusalem, but the surrounding territory, fled before the Assyrian army. So that's the first part of the verse. At the noise of the tumult, the people fled. But look at the second part of the verse. At the lifting up of thyself, when God raised himself up, at the lifting up of thyself, the nations were scattered. Another thing to understand in Old Testament writing and prophecy in particular, the people refers to the people of Israel, or in this case, people of Judah. The nations refer to the Gentiles. Those are not of the nation of Israel. So what it's saying here in verse 3 is that the Assyrian army came, the people of Judah were afraid, they fled before them, but when God raised up, when God raised up and slew multitudes of them, then the nations, or the Gentiles, were scattered. And then in verse 4, And your spoil shall be gathered like the gathering of the caterpillar, as the running to and fro of the locust shall he run upon them. The Lord is exalted, for he dwelleth on high. 
He has filled Zion with judgment and righteousness. Zion is another reference to Mount Zion or the location of Jerusalem where God has placed his name. This is true physically speaking of literal Jerusalem here on earth, but it is also refers to God's kingdom in heaven or God's throne in heaven. So again, verse 5, the Lord is exalted, for he dwelleth on high, for he hath filled Zion with judgment and righteousness. And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times, and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Behold, the valiant ones shall cry without, the ambassadors of peace shall weep bitterly. The highways lie waste, the wayfaring man sees it. He hath broken the covenant, he hath despised the cities, he regardeth no man. This is, again, a reference back to Sennacherib. The earth mourneth and languisheth, Lebanon is ashamed and hewn down. Sharon is like a wilderness, and Bashan and Carmel shake off their fruits. Go back, if you will, to uh, verse 3. At the noise and tumult, thy people fled. At the lifting up of thyself, the nations were scattered. Now, we just read uh, that passage where it sounds like devastation and destruction, and it is. This is the Assyrian army and their devastation, their destruction, their attack. But look at verse 10. Now will I rise, saith the Lord. Now will I be exalted. Now will I lift up myself. Ye shall conceive chaff. Ye shall bring forth stubble, your breath as fire shall devour you. And the people shall be as the burnings of lime, and its thorns cut up, they be burned in fire. Hear ye that are far off what I have done, and ye that are near, acknowledge my might. What is he saying? God is saying, you're going to answer to me. And they did. Not just... Sennacherib and the Assyrians, but notice verse 14. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Hence the reference in verse 12, the people shall be as the burnings of lime. Verse 14, the sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness hath surprised the hypocrites. See, God is dealing with, yes, the Gentile Sennacherib <laughs> and his army, but he's dealing with sin among his own people. And he does. Think of this. These are the residents of Jerusalem. Some of them, God calls hypocrites. Later, when Jesus came, he talked to the religious leaders of the day and said, What one do you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites? And there he gave the strongest message he ever gave regarding hell. And there he used the term, Where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. So here in verse 14, the sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness hath surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Watch this. Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Where to the everlasting burnings? Again, Jesus talked to the place where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Now I've often thought about that, what Jesus said there. He said, where their worm died, not, not the worm. There were T-H-E-I-R, uh, their worm. And I'm not totally sure what he meant by that. Several possibilities come to mind. It could be that he's speaking of the soul as being helpless in hell, as helpless as the worm in the flame. It could be that he was speaking of worms eating away at the soul forever. Why would you think that? Uh, King Herod, not Herod the Great, but King Herod gave a speech and was smitten and was eaten of worms because he took glory that belonged to God. It could be something like that that Jesus had in mind. It may not be that. It may be something else again. But the truth of the matter is, Jesus said very clearly, where their worm died not, and the fire is not quenched. So here, Isaiah uses similar language in verse 14. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. 
Well, they were in Jerusalem. They were citizens of Jerusalem. They were Israeli. They were of Judah. They were Jewish. Aren't they saved? Apparently not. It's no more than somebody would be saved by being a member of the church, even this church. You can be a member of a Bible-preaching, Bible-believing, Bible-teaching uh, church and still not be saved. It's not supposed to be that way. Only believers should be baptized. Only believers should join the church. But sometimes people aren't honest about things. And they get their way in. And they tell you what they want. They, they know you want to hear. I mentioned that this morning about a man I knew who he'll tell you what he knows you want to hear to get what he wants. And he's done that all the years that I've known him. To the point that, and by the way, he's not here tonight, so don't look around him. <laughs> but, but I honestly have come to the point where I, I have a hard time believing anything the man says. Because again, he'll tell you just what he knows you want to hear. Now, a lot of salespeople are like that. They're not all like that, thank God. Have you ever met an honest salesman? I have. I have. But some use that technique. So we shouldn't be shocked to read that there's sinners in Zion. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? They're lost. They're lost, separated from God forever. But what about those who believe? Verse 15, he that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he that despiseth the gain of oppressions and shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. In other words, the person who turns away from their sin the person who despises sin, the person who doesn't want to go back to where they were before. This person is following the Lord. What's going to happen to him? Well, not dwelling with everlasting burning, but in verse 16, he shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him. His water shall be sure. Now watch this carefully. This is where we take our title tonight, verse 17. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off. What do we see tonight? Redeemed. I know I shall see in his beauty the king in whose law I delight. What do we see tonight? I am bound for the promised land. <clears throat> what do we see tonight? I shall know him. What does this verse talk about? All of those things. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off. Thine heart shall meditate the terror. Where is the scribe? Where is the receiver? Where is he that counted the towers? Thou shalt not see a fierce people of a deeper speech than thou canst perceive of a stammering tongue that thou canst not understand. What is he saying? Yes, some will be taken away, but in verse 19, you're not going to see that. They're going to be spared. Jerusalem would be spared from the Assyrian army. And from their attack. But look at verse 20. Look upon Zion, the city of our solemnities. Thine eyes shall see Jerusalem, a quiet habitation, a tabernacle that shall not be taken down. Not one of the stakes thereof shall ever be removed, neither shall any of the cords thereof be broken. That cannot be talking about the Jerusalem of Isaiah's day. For that was indeed destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar. Was it rebuilt? It was in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. But then destroyed again. Until very little of that original city is left. And most of the ruins that you see there are not from the Old Testament times. Some of them are. Most of them are from the New Testament times. And the temple itself, gone entirely. So it cannot be talking about that. Not if prophecy is true, not if the prophetic word is true. By the way, God has gives prophecy throughout his word. In Genesis, God began to give prophecy. 
prophecies. Moses gave prophecies. We find prophecies throughout. In the Psalms, there are prophecies given, particularly Messianic prophecies. And then we begin with the major prophets, with Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and then the minor prophets. All of them telling us of things yet to come. Some shortly fulfilled, as in the defense of Jerusalem against the Assyrian army. Some have a long-term fulfillment. This verse must talk about the preservation of Jerusalem from Sennacherib's attack, but the language of the verse can't mean only that, as we said. It has to be taking the longer look. Verse 21, but there the glorious Lord will be unto us a place of broad rivers and streams. Now take note of that. Keep that in mind. There, where? In Zion, in the city of Jerusalem. There the glorious Lord will be unto us a place of broad rivers and streams, wherein shall go no galley with oars, neither shall a gallant ship pass thereby. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. Watch this. He will save us. Their tacklings are loose, the tacklings of the ship. They could not well strengthen their mats. They could not spread the sail. Then is the prey of great spoil divided. The lame take the prey. Now, we're going to come back and finish verse 24 in a moment. But let me back up a little bit here to verse 21 again. There the glorious Lord will be unto us a place of broad rivers and streams, wherein shall no galley with oars, neither uh, shall gallant ship pass their mind. Let's talk about this. This cannot be, again, the Jerusalem of Isaiah's day. I like Christmas music. I, I like the songs we sang tonight. I like Christmas music. I think some of the most beautiful music ever written is written about Christmas. And... Uh, I, we could all think of beautiful Christmas songs. And I don't mean the, the secular songs. Some of those are nice. But I mean the ones that are about the Lord. And the Lord's coming. And the salvation that came into our world. And there's a Christmas song that really is a nice melody. I haven't heard it much in recent years. I used to hear it more. And I think, I trust that the writer meant it metaphorically rather than literally. Uh, I have to believe that. Because the, the nice Christmas hymn says, I saw three ships come sailing into Bethlehem, to Bethlehem. I saw three ships come sailing into Bethlehem in the morning. Physical impossibility. There is no way ships can sail into Bethlehem. If you know where the location of Bethlehem is, it's in the mountains. Uh, the closest water would be the Dead Sea or the Jordan River would be closer. But you're not going to sail ships to Bethlehem from either one of those. So I have to believe the writers meant that metaphorically. I bring that up to say this. Why does the prophecy bother to tell us no galley with oars, uh, neither shall gallant ship pass their by? In verse 23, thy tacklings are loose. They could not well strengthen their mass. Well, I think he's telling us a couple of things there. I think he's using a bit of metaphor here, talking about those who would come as a mighty ship. They're not literally a ship sailing into Jerusalem. Again, that's a physical impossibility. But those represented by the ship here could not come in, could not come into harbor, could not come into attack. <coughs> but I think there's more to it. Go back to verse 21 again. There. Where is there? Go back to verse 20. Look upon Zion, the city of our solemnities. Thine eyes shall see Jerusalem, a quiet habitation. A tabernacle that shall not be taken down. Not one of the stakes thereof shall ever be removed. Neither shall any of the cords thereof be broken. This sounds like an eternal Jerusalem, wouldn't you think? It's never torn down. It's never broken. And it's a quiet habitation. So there is no attack. There is no possibility of an attack there. 
Verse 21, but there the glorious Lord will be unto us a place of broad rivers and streams. What's a, a place? The, the Lord will be a place of broad rivers and streams. We'll go to verse 24. And the inhabitant shall not say, I am sick. The people that dwell therein shall be forgiven their iniquity. He's talking about Jerusalem there. He's talking about a place in Jer called Jerusalem, a place called Zion, where people don't get sick. He's talking about a place where the people there are forgiven. Look at verse 22 again. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. He's all of that. He will save us. We don't save ourselves. The Lord does this. And notice, Lord, again, is in all capital letters, in, in all cases in this verse, the salvation name of God. So we could read it this way and not do violence to Scripture, for the Savior is our judge, the Savior is our lawgiver, the Savior is our king, he will save us. Now, why don't you read it that way all the time, preacher? Because that's not how it's written. But this meant there, it's the idea, it's carried. Now I want you to do this. We talk about prophecy, and I was talking earlier about prophecy given throughout the Bible. And we went through the minor prophets and made reference to it. You get to the Gospels, Jesus made prophecies. There are other prophetic passages in the New Testament. But the summation of it all, the summation of the Bible, the summation of biblical prophecy is the book of the Revelation. Does that make sense? So let's leave Isaiah 33 and turn with me over to Revelation 21 to keep in mind what we read in Isaiah 33. Look at Revelation 21 and verse 1. John writes of the revelation that was given to him, that which he was allowed to see. In Revelation 21, 1, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat on the upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Now we're going to skip a good bit, not because it isn't important or isn't good, but more for the sake of time. Come down to verse 23, if you would. Now keep in mind the things we read in Isaiah 33 regarding Jerusalem. You should have already recognized some things. But now look at Revelation 21, 23. And the city had no need of the sun, neither the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the land is the light thereof, and the nations of them which are saved. Notice who's there. The nations, the Gentile nations, the nations of them which are saved, not all, everybody from every nation on earth is there, but people from every nation on earth. People, it says in another place, of every tribe and kindred and tongue. The nations of them which are saved. Who's in, who's in this place? Saved people. No question about it. Those whose iniquity has been forgiven. What did he say in Isaiah 33? God is our king. God will save us. The nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. 
and the gates shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And, notice verse 27, there shall be, there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever work of abomination or make a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb book of life. There's no sin there. <coughs> There's no iniquity. Only those who have been forgiven of their iniquity, only those who have been forgiven of their sins, only those who have been saved. Well, what about it? the rest of the passage? We'll go to chapter 22. By the way, I hope your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life, but if it isn't, it can be. Chapter 22, and he showed me a pure river of water of life. Do you remember John chapter 4 where Jesus met the woman at the well? And he asked her for a drink and she said, how is it that thou being a Jew asked me to a Samaritan a drink? And he said, if you knew who you were talking to, you would have asked me and I would have given you living water. Well, she said, well, give me this living water so I don't have to come and get water out of the well anymore. He, and that's the thing you don't understand. And he shared with her about himself, and she came to realize that he was the Messiah, the Savior. Now look again at chapter 22, verse 1, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, living water, clear as crystal. And notice the source of it, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. What did it say in Isaiah 33? God would be the source of water. God would be the source of a river. It's exactly what it says here. In verse 2, in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life. And is that the same tree of life that was in the Garden of Eden? Well, I'm going to tell you that I have studied the Bible now for almost 50 years, and I have researched things, and I spend a lot of hours studying and, and try to, to thoroughly research things. And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it is or isn't. I really can't say. Some more brilliant individual may be able to answer that question, but I cannot. Verse 2 In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruit, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more. Curse. The sin curse gone. Gone forever. None of the trouble, none of the labor, none of the pain that we have because of the sin curse, none of the separation that we have. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. What are you going to do in heaven? You're going to serve God. Oh, I thought we were floating around on clouds playing hearts. We've been watching too many cartoons. You know? it's, no, his servants shall serve him. You don't have things to do. You don't be bored. I mean, how many millennia can you sit on a cloud and play a heart and, and not get tired of it? I don't know the answer to that question either. But I do know this. That's not what you're going to be doing. You're going to be serving the Lord. Verse 4, they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Notice the first part of verse 4, and they shall see his face. What did Isaiah say? Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. Isn't that what he said? Fanny Crosby wrote that first hymn we sang, Redeem. She wrote, and no doubt she got it from Isaiah 33, I know I shall see in his beauty the king in his law I did like. She wrote the third song that we sang, I shall know him. I shall know him when redeemed by his side I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him by the prince of the nail. Here's the thing. From the time she was just a, a, an infant, really, Fanny Crosby was blind. She had never seen anybody. 
she said, I'm going to see the kingdom of you. And you know what? I'm going to know who he is when I see him. And what else? If you have been redeemed, if you have been saved, you're going to see him too. Have you ever thought about this? You and I have never seen the Lord. We don't really know what he looks like. We have an idea. All of us have an idea. Everybody has a mental conception of what the Lord looks like. Oh, yeah, I've seen pictures of him. You know, you've seen paintings and drawings that people have done of what they think the Lord looks like. Because they haven't seen him either. But when you see him, you're not going to say to somebody next to you, hey, who's that? <laughs> you're not going to have to ask. You'll know who he is. You'll know. Just as the Lord saved Jerusalem from the Assyrians, so will he save those who trust in him. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And then redeemed by his side. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for that which is prophesied, that which is promised in your word. And Lord, it is my earnest prayer that you would help us to rejoice in the fact that we have been redeemed, been forgiven, been saved, washed in the blood of the Lamb, cleansed, and set apart for your service. Lord, we look forward to that day which is to come. The day when we'll finally be home. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. In a group like this, I would imagine most everybody here knows the Lord, but on the chance that there's somebody who may not have that settled, I invite you, I plead with you, to open your heart and trust Him right here, right now. Call on and say, Lord, I believe. I believe that you love me. I believe that you're the Son of God. I believe that you paid for my sins on that cross. Yet I believe you're alive today, ready and willing to forgive me, to cleanse me, to save my soul, to give me everlasting life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, perhaps you prayed that prayer with me. Good chance you didn't. But if you're not settled on that matter, I'd like to help you with that. So we'll sing a hymn of invitation. When we do, you can come. We'll have somebody take the word of God and show you what it means to be saved. If, as I think may be the case, most if not everybody here tonight has already trusted the Lord, then would you turn to him and be encouraged by the promises he has made, knowing that he keeps his word. He has kept his word, he will keep his word. And that there's coming a day when we'll be at home in that new Jerusalem. Father, thank you so much that we can call you our Heavenly Father. And now, bless and help us we come to this invitation time. <coughs> there are spiritual decisions that need to be made if there are folks who need prayer. There are folks who need to make decisions. Let them come. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're